Everybody take a nice, deep breath. Let it out. One more. You know when you get tense? You ever get tense? <laughs> Anxious? Concerned? You know, that, that's, a, that's a great little exercise where you just breathe in the good new air and blow out all that bad air. And just do that for a few minutes, and you'll be surprised how, how a state of tranquility and peace will enter your life. I'm not talking about any kind of Eastern mysticism meditation, but I'm, I'm talking about just good things for you to do to relax yourself and get that good oxygen into your brain, because we do get tense sometimes. Hmm? I am as nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof every time I come up here. Amen. No, it's true. I, I, I sit there with my stomach just turning. Why? Because who's sufficient for these things? Who? That God would use mere men to express his glory, the salvation that he has brought us? It's an impossible task. So once again, tomorrow morning, I'll begin to write my resignation. <laughs> you know. But this morning, I have prepared some things that I believe the Lord gave me to talk about this peace. This shalom is in the Hebrew. What's the Greek word for the peace equivalent? Irene. Irene. Shalom in the Hebrew, Irene in the Greek text. But let's go to Numbers chapter 6. Most of you are probably familiar with Numbers 6. What number? Number six of numbers. Yeah. The peace that we're talking about for this particular Advent season is a peace that does not exist on earth. It's not innate within you. It's a peace that can only be given to you by God. When God was instructing Moses to instruct Aaron on how they should pray for the people, he simply offered this ironic blessing. Look at this prayer. Verse 22 of chapter 6, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on their children, the children of Israel, and I will bless them. So it's God who brings about this blessing as they petition God for it. Hmm? Now look at chapter, uh, look at Psalm 37 for a minute. Case in point that it's God who brings about this blessing. Let's go to Psalm 37. And like righteous Lot, are we not vexed living in this fallen culture that we're in? It's not a post-Christian culture. It's a pagan culture we're in. Make no mistake about that. But I, am, I take great comfort in the fact that my God is sovereign and every saint gets their reward. Is that true? Yeah. But every devil gets their due. Make no mistake about that either. No one gets away with the evil that they're doing. Here he begins uh, 37.10, no, for 37.9, for evil doers shall be cut off. But those who, wait, what's the word wait here? It's the word kava, wait with the Lord, wait connected with the Lord, twisted together, bound with the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? But those who wait on the Lord, <clears throat> they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but he shall be no more. Oh, boy, we can't wait for that day. And especially the day that God takes Hasatan, Satan, and casts him into the lake of fire, where he will put previously the false prophet and the Antichrist. And then evil will be done away with once and for all, forever. Wow. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah. But look what the psalmist declares now. But verse 11, but the meek or the humble shall inherit the earth. Now, Jesus quotes this in the Mount of Beatitudes, doesn't he? Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. 
quoting this text, the meek, for they shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of shalom, peace. Now, what is your understanding of this peace that we're talking about, this shalom? What does it mean? Peace with God, okay. But how would you, dis- how would you try to describe this peace in a little more detail? Huh? I didn't hear you. It surpasses all understanding, but help me in your understanding of peace. It's what? End of hostility. Hmm, okay, that's closer. All right, finish this. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Nick, you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I would imagine that some of you younger people don't know that rhyme, Humpty Dumpty. You know. Yeah, yeah, no, it's reconciliation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, 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 what was requested that man could not do? All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together. Can, can man repair what has happened to fallen, sinful humanity? No, no. Humanity sat in a garden and had a great fall. And no matter how many empires, no matter how many men, they can't put humanity back together. This word peace is God taking up the pieces of our life and making us whole. Shalom. It, you know, if you were in Israel, it's a customary greeting for the Jews, right? They would say, shalom. Alekum. Shalom Alekum. And they would touch their heart, they would touch their lips, and they would touch their mind. All of my heart's desire, every word that I would speak on your behalf, and my mind's thoughts are for God's shalom. God's putting you back together to make you whole. You know why we're all here? Because we're not all there. (laughs) But together. Nobody has it all together, but together we have it all. But we're here because we're not all there. Which of us? Which of us are not broken? We're broken humanity. And like Humpty Dumpty, all the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put them back together. All of humanity, all of the religions and the isms of this world can't put you back together. Only Messiah, only Jesus, only the Savior, only God the Father can put you back together. What is that adhesion molecule that's in every single cell that's holding us together, the glue? Laminin. Is that amazing? How many of you don't know what laminin is at all? Come on, be honest. Okay, good, good, good. Laminin is an adhesion molecule that holds you together. In every cell of your body, you'd fall apart completely. But you know the amazing thing about laminin when you look at it through a very powerful microscope? It's in the shape of a cross. What's holding you together? If it's, if it's not Jesus and your understanding of his love for you and his reconciliation, you will fall apart eventually. Because God declares, Isaiah 48, I think it's 22, for there is no peace for the wicked. Wicked. Oh, their life will fall apart because they haven't allowed him to bring that wholeness, that shalom, that peace. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 9 for a minute. So many wonderful prophecies in Isaiah concerning the first and the second coming of our Jesus. But as Isaiah chapter 9... Verse 6, for unto us a child is born, the child of Mary, fully human, right? For unto us a son is given, the son of God, the darling of heaven, fully divine, fully man, fully divine. And the kingdom, the government is okay, but, you know, I think God would prefer that we use the words he uses, and it's not so much Christ's government as Christ's kingdom. 
The Bible talks a lot about the kingdom, doesn't it? The kingdom of heaven. You know the five aspects of the kingdom of heaven? Do you know some of them? I mean, we've all gone through those before. What are some of the aspects of the kingdom of God? The theocratic kingdom. That was when Moses was God's delegated authority, and God was ruling over Israel through Moses. That was a theocratic kingdom. Now, during the millennial reign, the millennial kingdom, a thousand-year reign in which Jesus Christ is actually reigning on earth, it'll be, once again, a theocratic kingdom, a theocracy. What were some of the others? you remember? Eternal. I'm sorry? Eternal. The eternal kingdom. Oh, boy. After the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, this remediation will take place of this earth for a short time, thousand years. But then at the end of the thousand years, a new heaven and a new earth. Eternal kingdom, which will never end. What else? I'm sorry? The mystery kingdom. Matthew's gospel in particular, Jesus would always say, and the mystery of the kingdom is that mysterion, right? Through the parables that he would teach. Oh, what meaning they have. Very different from the eternal kingdom. Very different from a theocratic kingdom. The mystery kingdom, which is a mystery to the unbelieving world. A truth God is revealing to his children. What else do you remember? Universal. Where God reigns Everywhere and at all time, doesn't he? Is there ever a time when God doesn't reign? Is there a place where God does not reign? Rule? No, never. And lastly, the spiritual kingdom, which you and I are all a part of. That's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, that spiritual kingdom, that eternal kingdom, the millennial kingdom, is where Jesus Christ is reigning and his kingdom and his rule will never end. That's what it's saying here. Yes, the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Ah. Samson's mother was told that she was going to have a child, and he was going to be a Nazar from womb to tomb. Hmm? And she never asked the angel his name, but she went back and told her husband his name was Manoah. Manoah. And so he said, well, let me talk to this man, you know. You're too old, and it's all about your look. You're cooking, not your looking. <laughs> and so when he confronts the angel of the Lord, not any, any, any angel, it's the angel of the Lord, after he questions him on it, are you the man? Yes, I'm the man. And what is your name? And what did the angel of the Lord, a theophany, a vision of Jesus Christ, say to Manoah? Why do you ask me my name, seeing it is wonderful? There's, listen, wonderful. Wonderful has its essence, its highest meaning, its quintessence in the person of Jesus. He alone is. He alone is. Wonderful. wonderful. Some of you got it. Okay, all right, all right. A little slow this morning. Maybe you've been sleeping, I don't know, late, late night last night. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Shar Shalom. That's what we're talking about now. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the only one that can bring about that peace that we're talking about today. Hmm? Yeah, Shar Shalom, the prince of peace. Of the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end. Wow. Isaiah 26, let's go there. God bringing about this peace that the world does not know, nor could it understand. Isaiah 26, verse 1, In that day this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong tower. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. What are bulwarks? Hosts, armies of heaven. Open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. You will keep. Now we're talking about God and the peace that he, can, he alone can offer. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for Yah, short form for Jehovah or Yahweh, for in Yah the Lord is everlasting strength. Wow. There, there are times when we all need our minds to be strengthened. When everything seems to be falling apart in our lives and we need the Lord to enter in and to come and, and, and to give us that peace that only he can bring even in the midst of all of the chaos, the storms of life. Go with me to Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story. Do you ever get tired of hearing the Christmas story? Never. 
Never. There's another movie you might want to take in at home. And, and the backdrop of the movie, contextually, is the Advent season. And it's called The Christmas Candle. Anybody ever see it? Yeah, yeah it's good, isn't it? Yeah, The Christmas Candle. It's a, it's a little fantasy in it, but it's really good. It's, and again, it's, the backdrop is this Advent season. You know. But chapter 2 of Luke's Gospel, look with me. Uh, Verse 7, and she brought forth Mary, you know who this is, her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. Oh, that stinking, dirty, filthy manger. I heard somebody say that recently. Was that true? Was it a stinking, dirty, filthy manger? No. Now, if you're here Christmas morning... Don't give it away, you folks that have been here for a while. If you're here Christmas morning and you don't know anything at all about the Migdal Edar, oh, you're in for a surprise. I'm going to give you a present Christmas morning that you'll never forget. How many of you know nothing about the Migdal Edar? Raise your hand and be honest. Oh, good. There's a few of you. Good. Yeah, I've got a surprise for you. It wasn't a stinky, filthy, dirty <coughs> manger. Not in the least. But you see... Don't let me get too far off on this one. You see, the Goyam, or the Gentile church, has completely disconnected itself from our origin, our roots, which is ancient Hebraism. The church is Jewish, not Gentile. We're grafted in. I'm of the seed of Abraham by faith. Is that true? Yeah. And, and so, so much of the Bible needs to be understood. I'm thankful for the Greek text. Why? Because English is a beggar's language. And even Hebrew is a beggar's language, but not Greek. Greek is not a beggar's language. Why? Whew, explodes with meaning. How many words for love? Five. And they all mean different things, don't they? But the... the, the English language, 20,000 words, and the Greek, 120,000 words. It's so much more expressive, you see. Why is the English la language a beggar's language? It begs for more words. I love ice cream. I love Snickers, my dog. I love my wife. I love God. Does it all mean the same thing? Absolutely not. Oh, but in the Greek text, whew, you can understand those variations of love. Hmm? And so, <clears throat> how expressive this is uh, when we talk about Christ being born in a manger. When you understand the Greek text with what kind of a mindset? Jewish. Jewish. Greek language, very expressive. God waited until the common language of the world was Greek. But it has to be all that is shared of what Jesus both did and said has to be understood from a Jewish mindset. And when you have that Jewish mindset, explodes with meaning. But the anti-Semitism in the church today, the anti-Semitism in the West, listen to me. Now listen to me closely. Listen to me. The anti-Semitism, passive as it is at times, but there's aggressive anti-Semitism, but the passive anti-Semitism that exists in the contemporary church today is a manifestation of the demonic influences in Christendom. With the emphasis upon the... For ignorance, for lack of knowledge, for lack of understanding my people perish. And it's true, beloved. It's true. Maybe I'm telling you more than you want to know. I don't know. Let's go on with the text. No room for them in an inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds that got in the fields, watching over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Why these shepherds? I'll tell you that on Christmas morning. <laughs> There's a specific reason why this angel came to those who were the outcasts of society. The shepherds were looked down upon. But he comes to the shepherds because the shepherds would understand the sign that they were given. And what does it say? For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this is the sign. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. 
And suddenly there was with the heavenly multitude uh, of heavenly hosts, army of God, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. Yeah, glory to God in the highest of heavens, in the heaven of heavens, right? Because the, the, the seraphim there cry out constantly, 24 hours a day, every moment of every day, holy, holy, holy. Kodesh, Kodesh, Kodesh is God Almighty. The only time they won't be crying out, holy, 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 is when? In the book of the Revelation, before the judgment of God, the wrath of God falls upon this Christ-rejecting world, there's silence in heaven, even among the seraphim, for half an hour. It would be deafening if I decided nobody speak a word for half an hour. For those of you who've been gathering together with me on Sunday nights where we wait upon the Lord, and sometimes we just wait in silence, it's uncomfortable for a lot of people because they're not used to doing that. But that's a discipline that the ancients would practice. Just, just focusing and meditating on the person of God. Distraction-free. Don't worry about your prayer list. Don't worry about whatever else is going on. Put all of those things aside and just focus on God. The Bible says we're to have dove's eyes for the Lord. Do you know that? What's characteristic of a dove's eyes? They have no peripheral vision. They can only focus on one thing at a time. Did you know that? And so we're to be focusing on one person. Who's that? Jesus. And so we to gather together on Sunday night at 6. That's all we're doing. We're going to talk about his attributes. We're going to talk about why do you ask me my name, seeing I am It, it leads you into a different dimension of prayer. <clears throat> anyway, uh, glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, arene, same as the Hebrew, shalom. Pulling you back together, taking all of those pieces of your life, that mosaic, that puzzle, and putting it all together so it's something beautiful. You know that song we sing, broken lives ruin people. That's who he came to rescue. To put a, that's the piece we're talking about, to, to put us back together, to make us whole. Goodwill towards men. Do you know what that means specifically? Favor. Yes. Men on whom God finds favor. Oh, what did the angel tell, to Mar tell Mary just a few minutes ago that we read? Favor. Highly favored of the Lord. Yeah. Now, this, this peace we're talking about, this peace is given to men and women, the, the word is for humanity, men and women, who are highly favored of God. How can I, in what way can I be highly favored of the Lord? By obeying him. By obeying him. Yeah, of course, of course. Turn with me now to, uh, let's go to Luke 19, speaking about this peace, peace on earth. Hmm? Now, you know, Luke 19 has to do with the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ. I don't consider it a triumphal entry, do you? No. No. The second coming, that'll be the triumphal entry, right? Yeah. Now, for, for a millennium, for a millennium, they were going through all of their religious rituals, right? They were going through all of their religious practices. Participation at the synagogue did not diminish. But the Spirit of God, the person of the Ruach HaGodesh in the Old Testament, the Numa Hagiosuni and the New, the, the Holy Spirit, he was taken from Israel. How long ago? 586 B.C. Ezekiel chapter 10. The Ruach HaGodesh leaves the temple, leaves Israel. Israel was no longer centered on the Lord, and therefore the Lord was no longer centered on Israel. If Listen to me now, beloved. If you make God and the worship of God a priority in your life, God makes you a priority in his. Yes. And goodwill towards men, it's God's good favor towards those who please him. Mm. Mm. Most don't understand it that way, do they? No, no, no. Well, did Israel please him? 
586 B.C., the Spirit of God leaves Israel not to appear again until when? Right here, Luke chapter 19. Isn't that amazing? All of those centuries, all of that millennium, the Spirit of God wasn't there, and they didn't. But they called it God's house. God just wasn't in the house. There's a lot of gatherings this morning, beloved. They, they call it God's house. The, Lord's, the Lord ain't in the house. And they don't even know it. Now listen, that's the frightening thing, isn't it? The, the frightening thing is that you would be so compromised, you'd be so assimilated into the world that you don't even recognize the absence of his presence. Now, as a Christian, I firmly believe, and I can support an apologetic, that once saved, always and forever saved. It's a gift of God. You didn't do anything to earn it, and you don't do anything to keep it. It's a gift of God. But you can render yourself completely ineffective for God. What happens when I grieve the Holy Spirit who dwells within me? He withdraws. He withdraws. The Holy Spirit is an eagle, an attack bird, a bird of prey. <laughs> no, the Holy Spirit is what? A dove. And you don't shove the dove. You don't grieve the Holy Spirit because when you do, his power, his presence, his person is withdrawn. When you have a dispute, a disagreement, I won't say an argument, you ever go silent? That, that's, that's how the Holy Spirit withdraws. He goes silent. Well, we wouldn't want that to happen, would we? No, no, not at all. The Holy Spirit left the temple because they were so grieving the Holy Spirit because of their religiosity. With their lips they draw near unto me, but with their heart they're far from me. Their lip and their life didn't match up, did it? You know, I've shared with you at any time, at any time get this woman aside, take her aside, and you ask her sincerely, because she's an open book. There's no guile in this woman. She can't tell you anything but the truth. You say, what is he really like? Tell us the truth. Now, what is he really, really like? Because we have a responsibility to be true, true to God, true to ourselves, and most important, true to others. Inside everyone you know is who? Somebody. Someone you don't know. Inside everybody you know is somebody you don't know. Now, now our purpose our, is to try to bring the shadow man and the public man together as one. I don't, I don't ever want to be presenting myself as one thing behind the pulpit here and another thing in my private life. No, no, no. What do we call that? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. And God will flee faster from your life, his power, his presence, when you're living a hypocritical life than anything else. Israel, for centuries, hypocrites. But the Spirit of God, the person of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Messiah, not returning to Israel to this moment, Luke 19. God, don't ever let me be so unaware of your presence, your power, or when I grieve your spirit, Lord, to where you withdraw. Chapter 19. Jesus is making his triumphal entry, verse 36, that's what we call it. And as he went, he, they spread their clothes on the road. And then as he was now drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice and a mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Easy to sing praises, isn't it? What's this crowd going to do one week later? Crucify. Crucify him. Crucify him. Give us Barabbas. We want the devil, not Jesus. We want to do what we want to do. Now, it's very easy to go from this, this, this proclamation of worship to becoming profane. Give us Barabbas. Crucify this man. Hey, it's easy to read a devotional, isn't it? It's, it's nothing to read a devotional. It's another matter to take up your cross and live a devotional life, isn't it? Isn't it, beloved? And, and those are the men and the women who find God's favor. Hmm? Hmm. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd and said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and he said to them, I tell you that if these keep silent, these very stones would immediately cry out. First rock concert. Hmm. Verse 41, now, as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, 
if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, your shalom, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Listen, many, many, many of these rabbis had whole books of the Old Testament committed to memory. But as I've shared with you on multiple occasions, an ounce of heart knowledge is worth a ten of head knowledge. An ounce of heart knowledge outweighs a ton of head knowledge. You understand? There's a lot of people that have it in their head. It hasn't gone down into their heart. A lot of people are very emotional. But loving God is not emotion. Loving God is devotion. Jesus made that clear. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? and not do the things I command you to do? Why do you say you love me and not keep my word? If you keep my word, I will love you, and my Father will love you because it's not my word, it's my Father's word that you're keeping. Yes, they were ignorant of the things that would really make for their peace. And if you read Josephus, and the account of what took place when the Romans destroyed the temple in 70 AD. All the Jews foolishly, ignorantly ran to the temple believing that God was going to protect them. They had rejected God, and now God has rejected them. Beloved, it's going to happen to the Babylon that we're living in. This nation, this culture has rejected God. And very soon, I believe, we're going to witness the rejection of this nation by God. Not the church, not you, not the body of Christ. You're the only thing restraining now evil from going full-blown and for the wrath of God being poured out on this world is, is the remnant, you see. I'll go with me to John chapter 14 for a minute, verse 1. How many babies are in the nursery, John Michael? How many? Three or four, okay. Just want to see how, mu how much of a lynch mob I'll have afterwards. <laughs> John chapter 14. Contextually, chapter 13, 14, 15, 16. Who is talking to whom? Jesus is talking to his disciples. Now, beginning in chapter 14, he's talking to the 11 faithful. Somebody's left. Who's that? Judas, Judas the betrayer. So now, beginning in 14, he's just talking to his own. This is the last words of a dying Savior. He knows what awaits him. Chapter 17, that, that whole discourse is 13 through 17. 17, he's praying. He prays for himself. He prays for his disciples, and he prays for you. You. Now, he's told them some very disturbing things at this point. What has he told them? Leave I'm leaving you. Matter of fact, I'm going to be placed into the hands of evil, wicked men, and they're going to kill me. And, and oh, by the way, many of you will deny me. Oh, Peter, you, the leader of the group, right? Peter, uh, they may, Lord, but I never. Peter, you're going to deny me. Three times. Before the cock crows twice. Three times. You'll deny you even know me. Now, this had to be very disturbing for them. For three and a half years, they've been with the Lord. And you know, you, know how, you know how cool it is being with the Lord? You don't even have to work. He provides everything. You want to eat? No problem. Give me a bread, piece of bread. <laughs> Comes loaves of bread, right? Give me a fish. <laughs> you know. Your mother's sick? Is that true? Your mother-in-law, Peter? Be healed. <laughs> I mean, it's so cool. Yeah. He provides medical, physical, Health and assurance, he provides all that we need, Jehovah Jireh, right? The Lord our provider. And he, he, I can't imagine how frightened they must have been when he said, I'm going away. Because he said, be anxious. Let your heart not be troubled. Hey, I don't know about you, but there are lots of things that have troubled my heart over the years. But I, I, I have to immediately go into that place of peace and get settled, come back together. Get all the pieces backward, but get whole again. What, what is it that steals your peace, honestly? 385. 85. Immediately steals my peace. 
too many people in this area now. What would you say? When he goes out of town. Yeah, it steals your peace. Why? Because, listen, peace is associated with, with trust and security. You trust John. You feel secure with John. Gail says, I feel better when you go out of town. <laughs> no, no. What else steals your peace? The go- <laughs> Caesar! Oh, no doubt about it. This corrupt government, you know. Now, some people just can't watch the news. I watch the news, and I just hear Jesus coming. You know. Yeah. What else would steal your peace? Unsafe family. Oh, boy, that's a concern, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, when things aren't right between me and my missus, you know, I just, it just steals my peace. I, I, right? There's no peace. There's so many things in this life that the world offers. Now, now some of the things that I, 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 I felt I know, he just called me and said, I lost my job. I got, not, not because I did anything wrong, not because I got fired. There's just, there's, there's just no work. Oh, boy, nothing can be more concerning than losing your income, particularly this time of year. Steal your peace. The world offers peace in the terms of security, financial security, relational security, you know, locational security. We all want to live in a safe place, don't we? Yeah. But that's not the peace that Jesus is talking about here. This is a peace in spite of all of those other things that you may have or may not have. He offers peace. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, we can find a way so that this world could never steal our peace, no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the situation. Go with me to chapter 14, verse 27. Verse 25. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. Shalom. Irene, peace, I leave with you. He's going away. But what's he going to leave them in exchange? Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit, which brings about peace. peace. The Holy Spirit brings us to the place where we trust the Lord. You see, the Holy Spirit tells us in Romans, and Paul writes, that no one will ever, ever, ever be ashamed of following the the lead of the Holy Spirit in being assured of Jesus' commitment to us. You will never be put to shame for putting your trust in Jesus. But putting your trust in Jesus and understanding who he really is, that brings us to the place of, of peace, of rest, of wholeness. He goes on to say, verse 27, peace, my peace, I leave with you. God's peace. He's called the God of all peace, right? In several places, bless you, my dear. The God of all peace. He's called the Lord of peace. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. The fullness of the Godhead offers you this peace that transcends every circumstance, any situation that we could be in. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, peace I live with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. February 24th, I believe, is the date, or the 23rd. What happened February 23rd or February 24th this year? I'm sorry? Russia invaded Ukraine. They were living in a peace that the world affords, the Ukrainians. They were prosperous. It's it's called the the, uh, breadbasket of Europe. It's also called the Bible Belt of Europe, you know, because many of the people are believers there. But but they were living in, in experiencing and enjoying a peace that the world offers, but it was stolen away in one day, in one hour. Have they been in that world's peace since? No, no. Many of them have lost everything. Anything that they would put security in, anything that they would put their trust in, it is gone. But the only one true place they can find peace now is in the worship of their Savior, in that blessed hope, the assurance that he gives alone. 
So it's Jesus leaving us his peace. He's going away. And he said, my peace I'll give to you, not as the world gives. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Hmm. Now, how do I process all this? Because in Matthew 10, Jesus said, I haven't come to bring peace. I came to bring a... A daughter will be against her mother-in-law, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, father against his son, son against his father. Their worst enemies will be members of... What kind of peace is this? Now, you, you can't guarantee relational peace, even among family, can you? No, no. And, and so often, your devotion to Jesus will disturb that relational peace that you have. I mean, it's going to happen. You know, it's nice to have good friends, but blood is thicker than water. Is that true? Well, in some extent, it is. Family's important. Blood is thicker than water. But I want to suggest to you that the Spirit, the Spirit binds and brings us together far more than blood ever will. Hmm? When we leave this place, we're no longer blood-driven, right? When Jesus appeared... Second post-resurrection appearance before the disciples, he said, touch me and see. Am I not flesh and bone? Why? There's no blood. He gave his blood. The life was in the blood in this life, but now he is spiritually empowered. And when we are translated, we're not blood-born anymore. We are spirit-driven, spirit-born. You must be born again, born of a woman, blood-born, but then you'll be born of the spirit, spirit spirit-driven. Spirit born. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. So this peace that Jesus offers us, his peace in particular, the God's peace, the Spirit's peace, where do we find that? Let's go to Romans chapter 5. This peace that God offers us happens in three forms. It happens the same way your soteria, your salvation occurs. This salvation experience, the big enchilada, it encompasses what? Justification, sanctification. Nobody's almost saved. You're you're completely saved, totally saved, or you're not saved at all, right? You are justified, you are sanctified, you are glorified. I want to suggest to you that this peace we're talking about, this peace from God, is exactly that. It's a peace because of our justification. It's a peace that it is within us because of the sanctification. It's a peace because of the certainty of our glorification. Whew. How could you have a bad day when you think about that? It's impossible. You can't. Hmm? <laughs> uh, good morning, Juan. Mercedes, we love you. I visited with Juan and Mercedes on Friday, and as you know, uh, he's dealing with a diagnosis of cancer. And it may be bladder cancer, maybe bone cancer. They're still doing some uh, investigation. But, you know, he says, you know, you know why. You know how one talks? Why, well, you know, uh, you, you know, uh, well, I told him, uh, you know, you know uh, the doctor, you know, I, death is my friend, not my foe. <laughs> and the doctor looks at him like he's got three eyes. You know, I mean, when does a doctor, when does an oncologist ever hear that death is my friend, not my foe? Hey, we're going on an absolutely wonderful, eternal vacation. But right now, there's only one way to get there. And no one can get there alive. No one leaves here alive yet, right? But we may be the first generation. I don't know. Oh, but it brings such peace to our hearts, doesn't it? And knowing this, so this peace he's talking about, it comes in three forms. It is peace with God. It is peace of God. It is peace the in God. And it describes the justification, sanctification, and glorification that Christ alone offers us. Do you understand this? So in Romans 5, Paul writes to the church of Rome that became Catholicism, that became Romanism. Oh, my. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So here we got peace, hope, joy, and love. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope, hope does not disappoint because the love of God 
has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. What does that mean? Hey, because of God's great love for us, we can completely trust him. So our hope is in him and in his word alone, the sufficiency of Christ, sufficiency of his word. Because of that hope, we have such a peace, such a settledness. You can't believe how Juan and Mercedes are both at such peace in this situation that they're in. And she said that. She said, Pastor Rita, I, I, I know it's the prayers of the people, but it's the peace that God has given me. I shouldn't feel this way, but everything is okay. No matter what happens, it's okay. We know where we're going. We know where we came from. We know why we're here, and we know where we're going. Peace. Wow. Peace with God. Through your justification is what he's saying. Look at me at the text. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. We had no inclination toward God's whatsoever. God saved you. God sought you out. You didn't seek God. Make no mistake about that. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, or even perhaps for someone, a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us, much more, much more than having now been justified by his blood, justified, reconciled to God the Father through the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. We shall be saved from the wrath through him. What are you saved from? God's wrath. Now, please understand, nobody goes to hell because they don't believe in Jesus. You understand that? Nobody, nobody goes to hell because they don't believe in Jesus. Believing in Jesus will save you from hell. If Jesus was never born, if he never lived a perfectly sin-free life, if he never died on my behalf, never rose from the dead, every man, woman, and child will go where? Why? Because you're sinners. Now, the world doesn't understand that. You need to explain that. They think they're going to hell because they don't believe in your Jesus. No, 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 no. My Jesus came to save them from the wrath of God, to reconcile men to God who were enemies. We were enemies with God. We had no spiritual strength or inclination. We were sinners and worse yet. What does it say? Look, look at the text. Verse 10, for if when we were, if I'm an enemy of God, then God is my enemy. <sighs> Chew on that for a little while. Now, if you're so hard-hearted that you've rejected the witness of the Holy Spirit, with regard to the person of Jesus Christ, you're an enemy of God. You're his enemy, and he's yours. Whew. That's a pretty serious matter. Who do you think is going to win that war? Hmm? But while we, and I was, I had no inclination towards God. I tried to read the Bible a few times before I was saved, and it's like eating sawdust, you know? Ancient words on a page had nothing to do with me. Yet, God loved me and brought me to an awareness. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. Not of works that any man would boast, right? But a gift from God. God gives the charismata, the grace gift of faith to believe. God has to open up the mind. God has to open up the heart. God has to open up your understanding. You, you'll never come to God. You're an enemy of God. You have no inclination. You're a sinner. But praise God that he saved sinners. I'm so thankful that he saved me. Aren't you? And, and now because of the blood of Jesus Christ, I am no longer an enemy of God's. I've been reconciled to God through the blood of Christ in justification. God looks down upon me just as if I have never sinned. He looks down that table, that communion table, and when he looks down at me, he no longer looks and sees my sin. He looks down in me, and what does he see? Jesus. Jesus. <sighs> Reconciliation through the blood of Christ. Wow. Justified. Peace with God. Hallelujah. What's that next form of peace? Peace of God. Peace of God. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to finish here in a minute, maybe. Quarter to 12. If, if, if the moms want to bring their children up or if there's a problem down there, let me know. John, Mike, I'm going to be another few minutes. Anybody in a hurry have to go. If your stomach's 
growling and you need to leave or you have an appointment, you have my permission to leave. I won't be offended. Well, bless your heart. You're going to stay. All right. Chapter 4 of Philippians. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That'll be next week. Joy, right? Waiting in joy. Let your gentleness, your humility, your humbleness, your graciousness be known to all men. Why? Lord's coming. The Lord is coming. Don't be prideful. Don't be arrogant. Don't be haughty, but be yielded and surrendered to God. And be anxious, fearful of nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then he, he tells you how you acquire that peace through the process of sanctification as you put your mind on God and his will for your life and you yield to the same. You have the power of the Holy Spirit to live a life that pleases God and to be one of his good favor. Look at the text. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is anything, any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, the things that are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, praiseworthy. Is that you? No, it's not you. It's not you. Don't be along with this anthropocentric church out there. They think it's them. Who's he talking about? Jesus. Jesus. Hey, that's what we're going to put our mind on tonight when we gather together, just to wait upon the Lord. Just put your mind on everything that he is. And don't worry about what you ate, right? Yeah. These, the things which you have learned and received and heard in me and saw in me, do these and what? The God of peace will be with you. This is our sanctification process. We think on these things, we meditate on the will of God, we surrender to the same, the Holy Spirit empowers us. I can't live a life that pleases God. It's not me pulling myself up by my bootstraps. It's me yielding to God and let him live his life in and through me. Lastly, peace with God, peace of God, peace. Go with me to John again, John's Gospel. Go to chapter 16. In chapter 14, he said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, nor let it be afraid. He actually finishes the same thing in his discourse at the end of chapter 16, when he says in verse 33, well, let's look at the context. Beginning in verse 25 for a moment. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that you, to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from, forth from the Father and have come into the world again. I leave the world to go back to the Father. John 13 tells us the same thing, that, that Jesus, knowing from where he came and knowing where he was going, he could suffer all these things. He endured the suffering of the cross. Why? For the joy, the joy that lied therein, that he would raise up to the highest of heavens, the heaven of heavens, to be glorified because of the sacrifice that he had made in reconciling the world to himself. And therefore, you and I one day, have the absolute assurance, not just of our justification, not just of our sanctification. My sanctification gives me every assurance of my ultimate. Hey, I'm going to be holy writ. Hmm. Why? Holy writ says so. Holy writ says so. Hmm. Read it for yourself. Look. Verse 31, Jesus answered them and said, Do you now believe because they confirmed his, the belief. Now, he's talking about eschatological matters, that he's going back to heaven, but that he would come again. He said that in chapter 14, didn't he? In the beginning of 14, if I go away, I prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. 
and I will come again to you and bring you into myself. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way, is there? No. So he, he's speaking with regard to the second coming with future prophetic events. What is that future prophetic event we're waiting for? We've been justified. I'm being sanctified. What am I waiting for? Ah, peace with God, my justification, the peace of God, my sanctification, the peace in God, my ultimate glorification. Christ, when Christ, who is our life, appears, and we shall be with him. All those who love his appearing have this hope. Do you? My, my heart has been longing for 42 years for my Jesus to come get me. This is the peace in God. Look what it says. Do you now believe, verse 32, indeed the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each one to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Listen to me, fellas. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world, every one of them was martyred except who? John. John. Reason for that, too. But every one of them experienced a very difficult life in this. There was none of the, they, they were not afforded any of the peace that this world has to offer. But they had the complete peace that God alone offers. Yes, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. This season, God wants you to know the fullness of his peace as he pulls your life together. And, and it's a process. You know, if he corrected everything all at once, the shock would kill you. But it is a process where he's really putting us together and making us more Christ-like than ever, making us fit for where? For heaven. That peace with God, our justification, the peace of God, our, glorif our sanctification, the peace in God, our glorification. Where did I start this morning? Numbers chapter 6. Let's end where I started, okay? And I'm going to sing. We're going to sing the last song together. I'm going to lead you in the ironic blessing. So go there. Numbers chapter 6. I want this peace for myself, but I want that for you as well. And this is the way in which God had instructed Aaron to bless the people. This is the way I know God has instructed me to bless you and at the same time receive a blessing for myself. Amen? Shall we stand? Number six. Can I share this in the original language? Yabarekaka Adonai. Varish Mareka. Yaer Adonai Panavileka. Vihuneka. Yesa Adonai Panavileka. Basamaka Shalom. Sing with me. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and to be gracious unto thee. Be ye gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Lord, you know uh, the situation that every one of us are experiencing right now. You know the number of concerns, anxieties, the fears, Lord. And this world really doesn't offer us any security at all. We're just one step away from where our Ukrainian brothers and sisters are today. But, Lord, they have your peace. And we ask that during this season, Lord, as we celebrate your first coming, peace on earth, goodwill towards the men of your favor. Lord, we pray that you would give us that peace. I thank you that peace has been exhibited in Hank's life. I see it in John and 
Leah, Lord, in mom. Thank you, I see it in Juan, Mercedes. Yes. We saw it so clearly, so evident in Cheryl. Mm -hmm. When she cried out, no more battles, no more battles. Hallelujah. So Lord, we ask you, would you bless us with your peace, mm -hmm. through your presence in our life. Yes. We have peace with God. We have the peace of God. And we want to have the peace in God. Yes. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 God bless you.